we invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans, the eighth chapter of the book of Romans. We will begin reading with verse number 26. That's where our lesson comes from. And the title of our lesson today is Spiritual Groanings. G-R-O-A-N-I-N-G-S. Spiritual Groanings. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what to what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Very deep thoughts here in these two verses. The Spirit himself maketh intercession for us. What is he doing? He's praying for us. Why? Because we know not what we should pray for as we ought. It's not just that the Spirit of God is getting your words up to God the Father. It's that the Spirit of God is getting His words in you, through you, to the Father on your behalf, saying those things that you need to say. How is He saying those things? With unutterable groanings. What is the voice of God? What is the language of heaven? How does God communicate with us? How do we communicate with God? We were taught from a very young age, if you were in a Christian home, to fold your little hands and bow your little head and close your little eyes and say, Now I lay me down to sleep. And you had a verbalization. You had a set of words that you said, and you said that was prayer. That's what's been shaped in our minds. But this passage here tells us that the true born-again child of God has the Spirit of God to speak for you, to speak in you, to speak through you to God with such things as groanings that cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. That's deep, folks. God searches your heart, but he listens to the mind of the Holy Spirit within you. Unutterable groanings. So it's not really you that are praying to God. It is you, but Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. It is the Holy Spirit interceding for you as you should be praying and speaking to God. God is listening to the mind of the Spirit. He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. God is listening to the mind of the Spirit, because he's the only one that can make intercession according to, to the perfect and precious will of Almighty God. That's the way that it is. Now, let's look at our word groaning. The word groaning comes from a word translated in Mark 7 and 34. He sighed, S-I-G-H-E-D, he sighed. Also comes from a word translated in Hebrews 13, 17, with grief. He sighed with grief. Did you realize that you have been praying more to God with those times of trial and grief and heartache when you groan in the spirit and you're so down and you're so oppressed and so suppressed and you're so depressed that you can't even say anything? You just groan. That's more of a prayer than what you realize. It is amazing. So let me ask you this. If you are a child of God, how did you get to be a child of God? Turn over uh, one page 
in the book of Romans to the 10th chapter. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 10. How did you know from the very instant that you became saved, that you became born again, how did you know that? How did that come to pass? Romans 10 and verse 10. For with the heart, that's not talking about the blood pump. It's talking about your soul with your consciousness, your inner being. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. First of all, there was the quickening or the making alive of you by the Holy Spirit. How did you know that? You knew it in your heart. You believed in your heart. There was a communion between you and God. No words spoken. Nothing said as yet. I know the rest of the verse. We'll get there in just a minute. But with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. So the instance of your instant of your salvation came with an unspoken consciousness in your heart you believed you believed unto righteousness all right the rest of the verse and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation so yes you confessed with your mouth but only that which you had first of all believed in your heart but that belief in your heart was a communion between you and God. It was the first awareness that you had that God was dealing with you or had dealt with you. And we called it, well, he or she came on a conviction. Actually, they came to salvation. They were born again. How can you be convicted of something if you're dead to it? So with the heart, man believeth. No word spoken, but an awareness of God in your innermost being. The person sitting next to you, next to you didn't know. Those folks round about you didn't know. Until you confessed it with your mouth, they had no awareness of what was going on in your heart. So the communion between you and God is in your thoughts, in your innermost being. It's in your heart. Look with me to the 139th Psalm. Psalm 139. And we'll read verses 1 and 2. Psalm 139, verse 1 and 2. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. You are in communion with God more with your thoughts than you are with your mouth. Yes, confession is made unto salvation. That's what sealed the deal, as it were. That's what confirmed it. But first of all, the consciousness of God between uh, you and the Holy Spirit, was done in your heart. God knows your thoughts from afar off. Go back to Job, Job 42, and verse 2. The book of Job, chapter 42. We'll read verses 1 and 2. Job 42, verses 1 and 2. Then Job answered, uh, then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Your communion with God is in your mind as you think. God knows your thoughts. You believe in your heart without yet having confessed with your mouth. And that was the instant of your regeneration. That was the instance of your new birth. Look at Matthew chapter 9 and verse number 4. The book of Matthew chapter 9 and verse number 4. 
And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? They hadn't said anything. Maybe the expression on their faces revealed something going on inside of them, but who could know it? Only God. Jesus, knowing their thoughts. Go with me to Romans chapter 2 and verse number 14. The book of Romans chapter 2 and verse number 14. The apostle Paul was a, an apostle to the Gentiles. Peter was the apostle to the Jews. Now, there's a lot of difference between the ministering to the Jews by Peter and the ministering to the Gentiles by the Apostle Paul. The Jews had a 4,000 years of history under the law. They had been brought up from an early age of memorizing and studying the law. That's what they did. But the Gentiles didn't have any such uh, pro uh, access to the law like the Jews did. So listen to what the apostle says in Romans chapter 2 and verse 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, dear soul, you as a Gentile, ever since you've been born again and been placed into the kingdom of God and the Spirit of God has been placed in you, you have been doing those things according to the law that are right. You believe thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, and all the laws of God. Yes. But, dear soul, you was not under the teachings of Moses and the rabbis like the Jews were. How did you learn that? When the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. You didn't have to be taught thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, and all of those things. The Holy Spirit made those things aware to you in your consciousness when you first got saved. Verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. God brought you up and made you understand what is right and what is wrong by the Holy Spirit. Your conscience caused you to understand what was right and what was wrong because it was a conscience governed and guarded and provided by the Holy Spirit of God, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In your prayers to God, maybe you're doing some other task. Maybe you're absorbed in of doing something, you know, uh, around the house. Or maybe you're driving on the expressway to work. And you know what you're doing. You know, you, you're aware of, of doing your task. But there can be an awareness of God in the midst of that. There have been times that I drove to work that I didn't have any consciousness of, did I stop for that red light back there? I don't even remember the red light. My mind was caught up in the things of the Lord. So there are unexpressed groanings. There are thoughts without words. And God knows our thoughts. And the Holy Spirit is praying through us, for us, with those groanings that cannot be uttered. So, dear soul, we understand and know that there are as the Apostle John said, there is a number in eternity right now that cannot be numbered. Hundreds of billions of people in eternity. 
I'm not talking about people that are saved that you call being in heaven. I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about everybody that's ever lived from Adam all the way down that's in eternity. How are they communing with one another, and how is God communing with them? They don't have a tongue. They can't talk. Their brain is rotting in the earth. There is a consciousness of that spirit wherein they commune with God and God communes with them, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. God's going to judge us according to our thoughts. He will judge us according to our consciousnesses. That's what he said. Jesus knowing their thoughts. Go back to Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 6. Proverbs 23 and verse number 6. Proverbs 23, 6. Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire thou his dainty meats. Listen. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. You say, well, so-and-so invited me over for a meal. And this is really great. I am really pr privileged to go to this man's house. He's rich. He's influential. He's powerful. He's in high status in society. But dear soul, you better be careful because you don't know what that man's thinking in his heart. Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye. What does that mean? It means you don't know what's going on in his mind. He may be thinking evil towards God and you. Neither desire thou his dainty meats. I don't know why that phrase is so hard to say. Neither desire thou his dainty meats. Well, man, we ain't had steak like this in my lifetime. I'm going up there and I'm going to have the best meal you ever saw. Be careful. Why? Because as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. You need to be careful. Dear soul, it would be better for you to eat a piece of dry toast with somebody that's not so rich and affluent than to be up there with him, eating with him, with him with an evil heart, because you don't know what he's thinking. The morsel which thou hast eaten shalt thou vomit up and lose thy sweet words. You ain't gone out of his house very much and gone back down the road to your place before you find out that he is plotting against you. And all of a sudden, that sweet, dainty meat that you just really desired and you were so caught up and so pleased with yourself that he... He had you to come to his house uh, that you didn't realize that he was just doing it to gather up information against you to be able to come against you. And now you say, look, wish I hadn't have gone up there and ate that dainty meat. Why? Because of the thoughts of his heart. Groanings which cannot be uttered. Proverbs 38 Proverbs 38, verse 6. Is that what I want? No, I'm sorry. There ain't no Proverbs 38. Psalm 38. Psalm 38 and verse 6. The book of the Psalms, our song book. And it's the 38th song and verse number 6. Psalms does not have chapters. It has psalms. Psalm 38, I'll get there in a minute. And verse number 6. The 
The Bible says in Psalm 38 in verse number 6, I am troubled, I am bowed down greatly, I go mourning all the day long. For my loins are filled with a loathsome disease, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and sore broken. I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Lord, all my desire is before thee, and my groaning is not hid from thee. The psalmist is saying, I'm in a miserable condition. This is a psalm of David. I'm having a hard time. I can't sleep. I'm in too much pain. Not just physical pain, but also emotional and mental pain. And he says, but all is not lost because all my groanings cannot be hid from thee. He had an awareness that God was aware of him through the groanings upon his sick bed. He had an awareness that God was aware of his thoughts from afar off, groanings which cannot be uttered. This old, how does heaven communicate with heaven? I'm going to take you into some deep water. Ezekiel chapter 1. The book of Ezekiel chapter number 1. I want to ask you this. How does heaven communicate with itself? What is the spiritual communication of God in his glory? Stay with me now. You're not going to understand this. I don't understand this. I'm not saying you, you're not smart. I'm saying... This is something far beyond what we normally consider. But I want you to consider it. I want to introduce you to this. In Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse number 4. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind. Now, what do you know about a whirlwind? And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there was a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and cloven tongues of what? Fire set on their shoulders. So the sound of a whirlwind and the appearance of fire was the Spirit of God coming to men on Pentecost. You know that. All right, that's going to help you. Ezekiel 1, 4. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, and a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself enfolding itself, just continuously rolling inside itself. And a brightness was about it, out of the midst thereof as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. Now, if you'll study the book of Ezekiel, you'll find that amber has to do with the glory of God. All right, that sets our thoughts. Ezekiel 1, verse 4 and 5. Now, drop down to verse number 12. Same chapter, same book, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 12. And they went every one, these are the four beasts, they went every one straight forward. Whether the Spirit was to go, they went, and they turned not when they went. These four beasts that came out of the midst of the fire represent the life of God within the soul of man. And the spiritual man is motivated and moved by the Holy Spirit. They don't turn to their left or to their right. That is, they have no choice of their own, but they are governed and guarded by the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's simply what this is saying. All right, and the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. Do you know about anything concerning this? The king says, did not we put three men in the fire? He said, yes. 
He said, but there are four men in the fire, and the likeness of the four is like unto the fourth is like unto the Son of God. So Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 29 says, Our God is a consuming fire. How is the earth going to be purged at the end time? It was purged in the day of Noah by water. Now, one of the things we hate to do after we get through with a good meal, we got to wash the dishes. Well, why are you going to wash the dishes with water? Because we're going to use them again. But if you're on a picnic, sitting at a picnic table, and you're eating off of paper plates, what are you going to do with them? Well, we're just going to throw these in the fire. Why? Because we're not going to use them again. The end time purging by God in that he's going to bring forth a new heaven and a new earth. He's going to purge this earth with fire. Why? Because he's not going to use it again. It's polluted with sin and unrighteousness and ungodliness. And besides that, those people that dwell with God are those who dwell in fire because our God is a consuming fire. I don't understand that. I told you you wouldn't. How can a human being dwell in fire? I'm not talking about a human being, flesh, dwelling in fire. I'm talking about the spiritual man walking in the spirit, and our God is a consuming fire. He is caught up in the fiery glory of Almighty God. You're going to have to come out of your natural thinking and try to get into this. I've been studying this passage, this chapter for 50 years and I still hadn't done any more than just scratch the surface listen for the likeness of the living creatures their appearance was like a burning coal of fire and like the appearance of lamps it went up and down among the living creatures and the fire was bright and out of the fire went forth lightning That's verse number 13. Verse number 14. It says, And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. They ran and returned like the appearance of lightning. I dare say that most of those who are attending this video have never ever had this presented to them and do not have any thought patterns concerning this being the type of the Christian. Now, since our God is a consuming fire, Hebrews 12, 29, then for us to be involved in God, is for us to be involved in the holy glory of God's fire. The purging, illuminating, warming influence of fire. How do we commune with God? These creatures go fast like lightning. And out of the fire went forth lightning. The, light, the fire was bright. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. So those prayers by the Holy Spirit. Stick with me now. You can understand this. I know it's different from anything you've heard before. But if you, since you are going to be in the presence of God before too long, you need to get acquainted with what it's going to be like. It ain't going to be like heaven. like you've been taught by religion. It's going to be like the fiery glory of Almighty God. So when the Holy Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, phew, that prayer goes like lightning in the presence of Almighty God. So that there, there is the lightning and the flashes of lightning uh, between us and, and, and all, my, Almighty God. In the book of the Revelation, it speaks of the temple of God open in heaven. 
and there was lightnings. There was lightning flashings and thunderings. And it talks about those things from the, this viewpoint, that this is the way that God communes with his people. And so we understand and see, dear soul, that we have the Holy Spirit to instantly flash prayers in the presence of Almighty God. It says like lightning. Go to Mark chapter 7. In verse number 34. Brother Gene, you're confusing me. Good. Why haven't we been confused by the truth of God before this? Why have we been able to go to church and hear the same old song and dance? We've just been on a rocking horse. Yes, there's been movement, but we're not getting anywhere. We're not moving on into the realm of the Spirit. All I'm doing is reading out of your Bible. I'm not making up anything. It's in your book. But why have we not ever considered it? It never has been brought up to us before. Mark chapter 7 and verse 34. Jesus takes the man aside that was deaf and dumb and in verse number 33 of Mark 7, And he, Christ, took him aside from the multitude. That's what's happening to you with this message. God is taking you apart from churchanity, from religiosity, and taking you into the realm of the Spirit. Listen. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears and he spit on his tongue. You say, I don't like to think about that. God spitting on my tongue. Well, how do you think man came to be formed at the beginning? And he formed man of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And he became a living soul. How do we understand that? Hundreds of years later, the prophet goes and lays down upon the dead child and says he put his eyes on his eyes, put his mouth on his mouth, put his arms on his arms, laid on him, and breathed into his mouth. This old moisture is exchanged. And that prophet laying on that child gives us an understanding of what God did in Genesis 2-7 in breathing into the nostrils of that form of life that he had made out of the dust of the earth. It gives us understanding of how God did it. And we see that Jesus puts his fingers in the man's ears because he can't hear anyhow. So he stops his ears up with the holy fingers of God wherein he drew the law. He inscribed the law on the tablets with the finger of God. Writing in our heart. All right. And he spit and touched his tongue. Now listen. And lift, lift, looking up to heaven, do you see your Bible in Mark 7 and verse 34? When I stop, I can't hear you, but you, you can say it out loud. Read me the next two words when I stop. And looking up to heaven, he sighed. It don't say he prayed. In a minute it will, it will, but it don't use the word pray. It just said, and said unto him, Ephrata, that is, be opened. But before he says Ephrata, be opened, there is a lightning flash that goes from the breast of the eternal Son of God by the Holy Spirit into the presence of eternal glory, as we read you in Ezekiel chapter 1. And that lightning flash, he sighs. There's a groaning that cannot be uttered. It's done by the Spirit. 
How does heaven communicate with itself? In the same way you communicate with heaven. And you and I have had more prayers issued up into the presence of God with groanings interceded by the Holy Spirit than with now lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. There are some godly people that are in heaven. Now, I'm not talking about just in eternity now, but in heaven. Godly people. But their bodies are in the earth. They didn't carry their tongues with them. They didn't carry their brain with them. How can they think and speak? How are they communing with God? You need to think about this. by the Spirit of grace and life within their soul and the Holy Spirit communicating between them and God now in eternity in the same and in the only way that they communicated with God when they were on earth. Yes, we thought it was now lay me down to sleep, but it was the Spirit of God giving forth unutterable groanings because we don't know what to pray for as we ought to. And the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us. He prays for us. So we don't sound like a bunch of little babbling babies that can't form words yet. The Holy Spirit communicates with the eternal God Almighty and presents logical, sound, spiritual, God-honoring, God-purposed groanings that are according to the will of Almighty God. I realize that this is a different message and it's not going to be well received by a lot of people. But this is what God sent me over here to say. And that's what I'm doing. I'm being faithful to God to tell you what God told me to tell you, and I'm giving it to you out of the spirit, out of the scriptures by the Holy Spirit. Now it's yours, and you got to deal with it. So we find, dear soul, that He sighed when He lifted up to heaven, and straightway His ears were opened, and the string of His tongue was loosed, and He spake plain. God had to sigh for this man to be able to speak. <sighs> That's a sigh. That's what Jesus did. Now the man can say, Hello, Mama. I've been wanting to talk to you. <laughs> he can talk. Why? Because God sighed. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. How does God speak with God? Do you have an example of this, preacher? Yep, John chapter 11. John chapter 11, verses 41 and 42. Those of you who are Bible scholars, you realize that this is this uh, chapter where Lazarus is raised from the dead. John chapter 11. Verse 39. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. That ain't good prayer. She's not telling God anything God don't already know. By this time he stinketh. Of course he does. They didn't have embalming back then. You died, they took you out and buried you. And so... She's saying he's been dead four days. Jesus waited two days to make sure he was dead four days. before. She's not praying. She's wasting God's time. 
verse 40, Jesus in his kindness and his patience attempts to get that little sheep back in line with God. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, there's our word again, for with the heart man believeth. When I was first born again, quick and made alive, it happened by me believing in my heart. Hadn't said a word, but it was instantaneous. And then later confession is made unto salvation. If thou wouldest believe, get back into the framework of believing God in your heart that thou shouldest see the glory of God. That's the issue. That's the issue, the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes towards heaven, showing you that he began to have a heaven consciousness and said I thank no father I thank thee that thou hast heard me wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute has what do you mean has heard me you read the whole chapter 11 of John you can't find where Jesus said now lay me down to sleep he had not said one single word to God that's recorded in this chapter but he's not a liar and he's talking to God the Father, so he's going to tell the truth. And he's talking to God the Father because there is a communion between him and God the Father that prayers go, as we saw in Ezekiel, like lightning up to the presence of God the Father. Where had the lightning gone up? Jesus said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. I'm going to insert a word to make sure you understand what he's saying. Father, I thank thee that thou hast already heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me. My prayer went up like lightning to heaven already. And I knew you heard it. And I knew that thou hearest me always. Then why do we have verbal spoken prayers? Here it is. But because of the people which stand by, I said it. With a heart... Man believeth, just as much saved as you'll ever be. You don't know how it happened. Nobody around you knows how it happened. But you know that old things have passed away and all things have become new. And you are instantly quickened and made alive in Christ Jesus. And then you put your mouth in gear and confession is made unto salvation. Jesus said, my prayers already went like lightning up to heaven, but... Now I'm going to put my mouth in gear and I'm going to say it out loud because these people don't understand, like Martha, that this is all about the glory of God. All right? And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. My word being spoken causes faith to come into their heart. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And in the beginning was the word, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and the word was God, and that's Jesus Christ. Now, I want to go back in the 11th chapter of the book of John and see if I can find out where these prayers went up into the presence of the Father. Because Jesus said, I've already said them. And you've already heard them. Go back to verse 33 of John chapter 11. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, watch it now, he groaned in the spirit and troubled himself, is what the book said. There it is. Hadn't spoken a word. But the Holy Spirit in him, like lightning, as we saw in Ezekiel chapter 1, that fire enfolding itself, our God is a consuming fire, Jesus Christ burning brightly in the fires of God's glory, shoots a prayer like, like lightning into the presence and consciousness of Almighty God. How did he do it? 
Well, it's like in Mark 7 and 34. He sighed, and the man's ears were open. And here he groans in the spirit. John eleven thirty three. He groans in the spirit and troubled himself. That's when the prayer went up and God heard his prayer. Look at verse 38. After they denied him and doubted him and said, Man, he's a healer. He could have kept him from dying. In verse 37, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that this man should not have died? We just want him to prevent the death. But they don't understand <clears throat> the resurrection. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection, verse 25, and the life. He that believeth into me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I'm not talking about physically dead Lazarus. I want him to be so physically dead that he stinks. I'm talking about spiritually dead, being dead in trespasses and sins. I'm going to raise this man from spiritually dead and quicken him and make him alive and cause him to be a born-again Christian. That's the resurrection I'm talking about. And dear friend, your justification is a picture of, of the hope of your resurrection of your body. Your spiritual justification was being raised from the dead. We were dead in trespasses and sins. You hath he quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses. God has quickened and made you alive spiritually. So that spiritual resurrection is a picture of and the hope that you have that one of these days your body is going to come out of that grave and you're going to be physically resurrected. That's what he's talking about. Verse 38. <clears throat> they said in verse 37, he could have been a healer, prevented this. And that grieved the Lord Jesus. And in verse 38, there's a very important word, the third word in the verse. Jesus, therefore, again groaning, in himself, groaning in himself. The Spirit of God maketh intercession for us with groanings within ourselves that nobody hears a prayer that cannot be uttered. But it's a lightning flash communication with God Almighty and the Spirit. And the Bible said, Jesus therefore again Second time, second prayer, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. And he says, Father, I thank thee thou hast heard me, in verse 41. He knew what nobody at that graveside knew, that him and God the Father had already begun to handle this thing. And there's all there's things that God will allow you to get into that your husband don't know and your wife don't know and your children don't know and your mom and daddy don't know and your, and your fellow believers don't know. There are things that God has had you groaning about. And you can't utter it. But you're in good shape because God is trying to teach you the difference between religion and spiritual life. Well, religion says, i got to say, no, leave me down to sleep. Spiritual life, you're communing with God everywhere, all the time. Your thoughts are always being heard in the presence of Almighty God. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth. When he spoke the word, and it was heard audibly, 
then there was a physical, visible result that could be seen. Nobody could see the prayers that he prayed in verse 33 and verse 38. It was between him and God. It was a groaning in the spirit. But when he comes to pray publicly, he says, I'm glad you already heard me. And I know you already heard me because this has to do with the glory of God. Pastor called on a man to pray publicly, and the man prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. They thought he never would get through. When he finally said amen, Pastor did something that nobody expected. He said, Brother so and so, same man, would you lead us again in prayer? The man started praying again. He prayed a long prayer, but not as long as the first. They thought he never would get through. And then the pastor did something nobody really expected. The third time he said, Brother so and so, would you lead us again in prayer? And this time he prayed a very short, concise, precise spiritual prayer. And the preacher looked at him and he said, Next time, brother, you need to be prayed up before you come to church. And, the, and this old sometimes we, we just babble on and on and on for the ears of those that are around about us in public prayer in church so they can hear how eloquent we sound. But you need to shut your brothers and sisters out when you pray publicly in church. You need to have a consciousness of God. And dear soul, it's not really prayer unless the Holy Spirit of God intercedes in you, through you, for you with groanings which cannot be uttered. Well, you're uttering all these words. That's not prayer. Unless it's the Holy Spirit in you doing it. In Peter's prayer, when he was sinking in the waves, was greater than the, all the prayers that he prayed so that everybody could hear. Oh, I'm a great apostle, Peter. All he said was, God save me. And Jesus saved him. We don't know anything about the Holy Spirit. We don't know what it means to be a Christian. We don't know what it means, dear soul, to be carried up into the presence of eternal glory. We don't know what it means for that brother or sister, whoever it was that's died and gone to heaven, actually born again children of God. We saw them, low, saw them lower their bodies into the ground. But there's a communion with them now without that body that was all the communion there ever was with that body for the entirety of their Christian life. Wow, that kind of scared me. That was thunder. <laughs> Made me jump a little bit. But dear soul, I hope you're getting what I'm saying. Brother Gene, this is confusing to me. Good. Good. I hope I can disturb you enough to where you will get out of your routine and your habit and, dear soul, just the commonality of religion and start beginning to commune with the person of the Holy Spirit. I need to, I need to, to close. I just looked at my watch and I see I'm about out of time. Let me tell you something. The difference between the first and the second creation. What are you talking about? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said. Now, what was God said? Well, if you go over to the book of Matthew, it said, And seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. The difference between God said in the second creation, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are they, he begins to bring forth the word of life <clears throat> to create spiritual life. In Genesis 1, he created physical life. But he doesn't say he opened his mouth. Why does it say in Matthew chapter 6 
that he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, because God didn't have a mouth when he created the heavens and the earth. I'm talking, it's, it's Matthew chapter 5, I'm sorry. But it specifically says in Matthew chapter 5, when he gives the attitudes that we are to be, which are nothing more than the character of God formed in us by regenerating grace. It specifically says he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, why does it say that? Because in the beginning, it was just a thought. God said, let there be. But there was no mouth to speak it. Who said it? God did. How did he say it? He thought it. But now in the second creation, when he would create regenerating life, regenerated life, he opens his mouth and taught them, saying, because with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And Jesus sighed, and he groaned, and he said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. I thank thee that thou hast heard me. But words hadn't been spoken. But search me, O God, and know me. Examine me, see if there be any wicked way in me, and Lord, you know my thoughts from afar off. That that's the way that's the way it is. God knows your thoughts. And dear soul, we need to understand. Habakkuk two twenty. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth pray. No. Speak in tongues? No. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. I don't think we really have an awareness of and have not been given by modern day religion and preaching and sermons a true picture of our relationship with God because we have a hard time understanding Ezekiel chapter 1. A fire enfolding itself. God communing with God, the creatures of the living spirit created by God in regenerating grace, enfolding itself and manifesting itself in the glory of Almighty God. For the, the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Why? Because we know not how to pray for that which we ought. In, 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 I know I've already closed my Bible. In Exodus chapter 3 and verse number 7, let me read you this and I'll close. Exodus chapter 3 and verse number 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Why did God send Moses and Aaron down to get the children of Egypt, excuse me, the children of Israel out of Egypt? Because he heard their groanings. I have heard their sorrows. Listen, little sheep, you're in a hard place. There are things that are insurmountable, insurmountable that you can't handle. There are things that you don't know how to talk to God about or much less anybody else about, but dear soul, it's being handled, and I've been sent over here to try to help you understand that it's being handled by the Holy Spirit, and it's like Jesus saying, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And all he had done was groan. Keep on groaning. Keep on sighing. Keep on being weighted down with with sin and and. and transgressions and, and failures and groan before God. And I'll tell you this, as a true shepherd of your soul, sent by God to tell you this, it's well, God is hearing you.
Don't give up. God bless you.